Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. As an independent podcaster, this really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Please visit patreon.com slash talkingtudors for more information. When you join the Patreon family, you'll instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to take part in a member-only book club. They can also enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the podcast to chat about her new book, 1000 Tudor People, is Melita Thomas. Melita is the co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a repository of information about Britain in the period 1485 to 1625. She's also the author of The King's Pearl and The House of Grey, and is a PhD candidate at UCL researching Mary I's networks. Her latest book, A Thousand Tudor People, will be released on the 28th of March 2024. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Melita. How are you? I'm really well, thank you, Natalie, and thank you so much for inviting me to join Talking Tudors again. I have to say the podcast has gone from strength to strength since I last took part in it. You've really massively expanded, and it's fabulous to be asked back. Thank you so much. I have been looking forward to talking to you. Let's just start with an introduction, because it has been a little while since you've been on the podcast, so would you mind just saying hello to everyone and telling us a little bit about you and your background? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Melita Thomas. I've got a master's in historical research from London University, the Institute of Historical Research, and I'm currently uh, working towards my PhD at UCL, where I'm in the early modern history department looking at Mary I and her social and political networks. I'm the author of two books previously, and this is the third one that we're talking about today. The first one's The King's Pearl, Henry VIII and his daughter Mary, then The House of Grey, Friends and Foes of Kings, and um, my new one, which is A Thousand Tudor People. I'm also the co-founder and editor of the online website Tudor Times, which hopefully some of you will have come across, and the co-author of the Tudor Times Books of Days series. Yeah, I've been quite busy in the last few years because I only started this as a second career. You have been very busy and the Tudor Times is a wonderful, wonderful resource. So I hope people have heard about it. So let's talk about A Thousand Tudor People, your latest book. So can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this? And also maybe tell us a little bit about how you've actually structured the work as well. Well, there's some two strands of how it started. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there were those lovely books, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die, A Thousand Villas to Stay in, really lovely glossy pictures, which were kind of comprehensive guides to whatever the thing they were talking about. And I thought that would be, you know, a fabulous thing to do for for the Tudor age. And we we talk about the kings and the queens and the politicians and Thomas Cromwell and all the rest of it. And they're all really interesting and sort of larger than life people. But actually, they didn't really impinge on everyday lives any more than royalty currently does. There are 
many, many other people out there living their life, contributing to society, uh, doing wonderful things. It was an age of discovery and of growth and of changes in knowledge. And there are just so many other people out there who I wanted to actually draw attention to. And also, you know, sites like the Tudors, you know, shows like that, they kind of make you cringe, but they also have characters and you, and you think, well, who were they? You know, who was the Duke of Norfolk? Who was the Marquis of Winchester? What was their background? So I also wanted it to be a guide to some of the real Tudor people that you come across in books or series or, or, or movies to give some facts, because what you see on things like the Tudors aren't always facts, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, not always, that's right. <laughs> um, and so given that there are lots of people that we could talk about and that you could have included how did you go about selecting the people? Well, I, I thought it would be hard to find a thousand interesting people, but actually there are dozens on the cutting room floor. I've got 250 lying in wait. Should another volume ever be required? <laughs> Although I'm not sure that it would be. You, I mean, you have to have the, the kings and the queens and the famous politicians. But after I'd gone through that, so I did the monarchs and their consorts, then the royal family, and then the key politicians, so Cecil and Cromwell and Wolsey and Gardner and the usual suspects. But then I picked some famous people from other walks of life. So I think Shakespeare, Drake, John Dee, I think were three of the first ones. And as I researched them, other people's names came up. So, for example, Shakespeare, then you've got the other players, you've got Ben Johnson and Kit Marlowe and uh, Thomas Nash and Thomas Kidd. And as you worked out from them, more people came to light. So there's the Shakespearean, the people who own the theatres, Philip Henslow and his sons, some of the actors, the, the fool, um, Will, who walked to, to Norwich or danced all the way to Norwich. That was his claim to fame. He danced all the way from London to Norwich. And so you keep finding new people and then they lead you to other people. I wanted as many Welsh people as I could find, being Welsh myself and having a Welsh publisher. So I thought that would be nice. And again, a lot of the history we see is very Anglo-centric. So I did want to look at people who weren't just in the southeast of England and particularly Welsh people. And I made a real effort to incorporate as many women as possible. Now, clearly women were not so prominent in society as they are now. And very often the only women you do find are in there because they were recorded and they were only recorded because they transgressed in some way. So the women do look disproportionately criminal, I'm afraid to say, although they aren't, you know, there are other, uh, other women who did interesting things. But I managed to get about a third women, which, you know, I thought was 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 pretty good. I, there was no possibility of getting it to be 50-50. But I, I felt, you know, getting to a third wasn't, wasn't too bad. And and was probably reflective of, of everyday life. Uh, women weren't necessarily as browbeaten as we think they were, particularly in the, the middle classes, the gentry class, where they were very active sort of economic members of society and the merchants' wives and the women who ran businesses on their own account. So, um, yeah, so that was really how I tried to put them together. Wonderful. And having had a little peek at the book myself, it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's so obvious that you've put in a lot of research and, and years, you were just telling me earlier, of research. So can you tell us a little bit more about that process and also maybe talk a little bit about some of the sources that you used and some of the challenges perhaps that you also <laughs> face, that we all face when, write, when yes. writing our books and even breakthroughs as well? Well, I, I wanted to set the scene as well. So it's not just about the people. There's a section at the beginning of the book about the the Tudor world, what, what was the world like for these people? And one of the reasons why the Tudor age is so interesting is the amount of change. I mean, in 1485, your life probably wasn't that different from your great grandparents in 1385. By 1600, it had changed, not out of all recognition, but enormously. I mean, the, the Reformation clearly altered society from top to bottom. Printing, the increased availability of education, the new plants that came from the new world, the looking out towards the Americas, particularly for, and this is a book about Tudor, so it's England and Wales and Ireland, it's not Scotland, but the, the looking out to the, to the West changed people's perceptions of their place in the world and, and their country's place in the world. The sort of weak version of history of the sort of isolationist nature of, of English society. And a lot of that began in the in this period rather than the feeling they're part of Christendom. So I also wanted to think about everyday things. What do people eat? Uh, what was the money like? Why why are they all called Thomas or John? And why are the women all called Elizabeth or Anne? <laughs> There's even at the beginning there, I've got a little diagram of show, showing how frequently the names occur. So, I, and, and what games did they play? So, there's that first chapter. And of course, that required a lot of research across a wide range of books. I mean, a, a great one to read is Ruth Goodman's How to Be a Tudor. That's, that's great fun. For the entries themselves, 
you can't, you know, I didn't want to just be doing a scrape of the internet and bad version of Wikipedia. So every single entry I've done has at least two academic journals or papers or books behind it, because if you just read one, then you get a very skewed opinion. So you need to read at least two different versions. And that's on top of the standard words like the Dictionary of National Biography and the History of Parliament. And one of the challenges, apart from the previous challenge I mentioned about getting enough women, is that a lot of the standard words like the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and History of Parliament, they were written or begun a hundred and odd years ago. And although they're being updated, they are still very Whig in their history. You know, Protestants good, Catholics bad, colonialism a good thing. We don't talk about enslavement, you know, so so it's a very little mention of the Tudor atrocities in Ireland. Don't really hear very much about that. So I wanted to actually get some much more up to date scholarly thinking into it. And I was lucky because I'm a postgrad student, a, a doctoral student at UCL, I have access to the incredible resources that UCL has, all of the unpublished theses, the journals, the online journals, the state papers online, amazing amounts of data out there. If you are in the fortunate position of being able to access them. Yes, I have to say, it's an independent researcher, Melita. You can just imagine the amount of it's, money I spend on yeah. books and articles and just, yeah, yeah I, astounding, really. I was previously in that position before I started doing the master's for my first book. And yeah, and you either physically have to go somewhere and then you can only do so much in a day. So I, I feel for you, Natalie. I'm just working out how I can click on yes. <laughs> into being affiliated to the university. And so you obviously talked about the challenge of, you know, trying trying to find women to to include in your book. Were there any sort of breakthrough moments where you thought, yes, I've found something, you know, or, or any of those kind of good story, happy moments yeah. in your research? Yeah, what's, what's nice is coming across interesting or not, not sort of massive breakthroughs, but people I'd never heard of before. Just one that springs to mind, a chap called John Dinham. And uh, he's he was a minor hanger-on, I think, and Henry VII's retainers. I uh, can't remember offhand you know, what, what he did specifically. But he commissioned a wonderful tapestry, which is in the Met in New York. And I managed to get an illustration of it from the book. But it's just this beautiful tapestry. And you think, well, what was in his life? What was he doing? What was he thinking? Why did he commission this tapestry? And you get these little, they're like little advent calendars, you know, where you yes. open, you get this little peep into somebody's life. And you can think, well, what was, what was going on around him? So, so things like that. And discovering this interesting woman, Alice something her name begins with b she was a merchant in this city uh the city of london um she was a merchant's wife but when he died unusually she remained a widow didn't remarry but she commissioned a painting of herself and her sons which is the first picture in english art of a woman reading but you know that's not the virgin mary that it's a, a secular secular woman reading so she was quite a hot protestant so was it was she saying something about her religion or was it just a prop is all the questions that it makes you ask about people and seeing them as real people not as bit parts in the psychodrama of the tudor monarchs Talk to us a little bit about some of those women that you have featured. Maybe if they're the lesser known ones, that would be really great too. Well, there's one of the most sort of appalling cases in a way. Alice Brigadine. She was, and there are all sorts of tracts and ballads written about this because Alice murdered her husband. She wasn't terribly competent. She was she was actually the stepsister of Lord North, who was in government both un- under Mary and under Elizabeth. And she married her stepfather's one of his um, apprentices because he he was a city merchant. But anyway, she didn't she didn't like him very much, and he was a bit reluctant to settle her jointure on it. So she took a lover. Uh, her husband was Thomas Arden. She took a lover called Thomas Moresby, and she made six different plots to murder her husband. There were 10 conspirators involved. In the end, she hired somebody called Black Will of Calais and he and Moresby went along to murder murder Arden. Black Will strangled him with a napkin. He then hit him on the head with a tailor's iron, after which Moresby slit his throat. But they were so incompetent that they trailed their bloody footprints all the way to where they threw the body and all the way back again. Mm -hmm. So they were all convicted and Alice, Alice was burnt because she was convicted of treason, not of murder, because for a woman to murder her husband was considered treason. So not a nice story, actually, but but so kind of extreme that, you know, you can't help taking notice. Another one I like is Thomasine Bonaventure, her name was. And she was a, she came from the West Country, from Cornwall, I think. And she married three master tailors in succession. 
And the third one was Perivale, or per Percival, his name was, and he was Lord Mayor of London in 1498. So she was, you know, high up in the city hierarchy. But she's the first woman below the rank of nobility to found a school. So she founded a grammar school in her home parish of um, Week St Mary in Cornwall. You know, you just think of these women and they've got some money and they've bettered themselves and, they're, and she's sharing that with, with her own parish. Most of the women who aren't criminals are involved in education, which is where, where they're recorded, of course, because they're in the founders list. Another one, uh, Catherine Hussey, she was the wife of Sir Reginald Bray, who was one of Henry VII's key money men. And she was a co-founder, along with her husband and Bishop Alcock of Ely, of Jesus College and she she became responsible for the master's salary and her book of hours is still extant and it's at Stonyhurst College. Yeah, so there's there's sort of women and then there's the woman who allegedly gave birth to cats and that was quite oh, yes, I have heard, heard that, that one before. Ale- <laughs> Agnes Bowker, I think her name was. Yes, yeah, so so that was obviously a, I think it was Archbishop Parker who said, you know, we know it's a con but we can't quite put our finger on, on, on how they're doing it. <laughs> love um, it really does bring the people to life that's what I like about these these sort yes. of anecdotes and yeah and so in terms of the men Melita who did you most enjoy writing about were there any sort of standouts well I, I have a soft spot for Thomas Tusser Thomas Tusser he, he wrote a guide to husbandry and, and and farming and he started out as a clerk and he he followed the dream you know the dream we all have of throwing up the city job and going to the country and running a farm and he created this beautiful fascinating book about how to run a farm and in fact it was a key resource for the Tudor book of the garden which did as part of Tudor times and it's all in verse about when what the husband does on in March and what the so the the husband and the good wife she looks after the dairy and the poultry and it's all in verse and it's you know quite practical but poor old Thomas you know it's a case of do as I say not as I do because he did actually go broke and have to go back to the city and take up his his clerical job again but I like him because I like gardening another interesting chap is Tom Sean Catty he's a great Welsh hero he's a a kind of a Robin Hood sort of a a character although I'm not sure he ever gave any money to the poor but he he robbed his victims by by conning them so the most famous story is he stole a bull and dyed its coat took it to market and sold it back to its original owner so the original owner he's taking he's leading the bull home the dye starts to come off and he realizes he's been tricked and he knows it's Tom Sean Catty so he goes to Tom's house and he gives his horse to, to, to a beggar who's sitting sitting nearby to gives the reins of the horse to hold while he goes in to look for Tum. Now, the beggar is actually Tum in disguise. So he leaps on the horse, gallops off to the bull owner's farm, says to the farmer's wife, your husband sent me urgently to bring him some money. He's, he's desperate for money. The fact that he's lent me his horse shows how, how much he trusts me. So she hands <laughs> over the money. So Tum goes off with the horse and the money and rides off to London. Uh, but he does, he does reform. He marries an heiress, settles down, somewhere in West Wales and becomes a magistrate and a, a pillar of society but yeah no he, he's quite fun Tom Sean Catty. That is a good story that's not one I've heard of I like that. <laughs> you, you're obviously very familiar with this period of history you've been studying it for a long time as well but did you still find that you came across things that kind of surprised you that you you know that you weren't very familiar with? I think probably because this isn't something that as Tudor times we've looked at a lot is a Tudor Ireland and I think it's something that has been avoided in history, partly because it is so difficult to write about even now, um, the contested history. But some of the Elizabethan heroes, I would take Edmund Spencer. Now, I had thought of Edmund Spencer as, you know, the writer, all right, so the fairy queen queen is criminally dull in my opinion, but, you know, it was was a fabulous book at the time and everybody loved it. But the stuff he wrote about the Irish, the racism, the appalling incentive to, to, to genocide that was in his works. And so I came across a lot more of that that I hadn't really been aware of or not wanted to to look at so that's and I certainly hadn't associated with Edmund Spencer other interesting things oh I think actually that I think they all traveled a lot more than we thought they did so you have the idea that everybody stayed in their village and never went far from home but certainly it's not the very poorest people but even at quite quite low levels of of society uh you know sort of economically people moved around a lot a lot more than you think they did they went to the hiring fairs and they went to different farms and they moved around so that that surprised me and the number of say gentry middle class ranks that traveled abroad and you do see I mean you see it in government the the number of men I mean you know the Tudor new men they did come from quite humble beginnings a lot of them I mean obviously Wolsey and Cromwell are the most obvious examples but yeah there was there was more social mobility than perhaps we envisage certainly for men women 
you know have to marry married equal or up whereas whereas men were a bit more more flexible I suppose yes I actually came across a similar thing and now I can't remember where I I saw (laughs) it or read it but it it was along those lines that women actually traveled a lot more for pleasure than we kind of imagined that they did of course it's probably more the middle class women and upper class but Mm -hmm. but it's really interesting to think of them traveling like we do for pleasure yeah I I wonder actually what what they did once pilgrimages were no longer Yes. available because yeah. you know obviously we can see from from Chaucer that the pilgrimage for for some people it was a religious thing but for a lot it was it was kind of a jaunt so yeah. what excuse did they use once they were no longer going on pilgrimage to to jaunt about the countryside they visited their families they yes. they went out to dinner that always surprises me when you see records of going out to dinner it just seems such a, a modern concept and so you were talking there about Edmund Spencer how it seems your opinion maybe has changed a little bit about mm him since you've been working on your book so is there any other person or other people who your opinion has kind of shifted since you've written this book probably not in that the famous people I knew a fair bit about already and the not so famous people it was it was all new really I think it's apparent from a lot of the stories particularly about the women but of course I am looking at the women who are in the record that they had a lot more agency than than we think and I suppose all of the anti- women rhetoric that you read is partly because they were doing their own thing and the men didn't like it (laughs) actually oh there was one chat now he's a bit of a hero actually another Thomas because as I demonstrate with my little pictogram of the names they're all called Thomas Thomas Eliot now you might have come across him he was he was a philosopher I suppose a writer and he was loosely involved with the Duke of Somerset's government under Edward VI and he wrote a lot of literature about the Commonwealth and how to live in society well uh, but one of his best known books is on the defense of good women and he talks about how women are not inferior creatures and they're equal of men and intellectually and and so forth so he he ch- does challenge some of the misogyny but he also asks a really interesting question about how we should live in society and how how we should all speak truth to power and that you should do it even if even if you know you're going to be punished your duty to your to your prince to your country is to speak truth even if you know that that will end in you being punished or in in the particularly nasty ways that Tudor governments came up with so he's a really interesting thinker and concerned for the for the common good well I think we like him now I think we should all look at (laughs) <laughs> Look at Thomas so Elliot. Like, Elliot, usually, usually spelt with a Y. With a Y. I have come yeah. across him before, yes, yeah. but um, I haven't looked into his life too in, in detail. But now I think he he deserves that. So, Melita, what other exciting projects are you working on at the moment? Well, I've got my head down to try and finish the PhD this year. Oh, so cool. if all goes to plan, I'll be handing it in at the end of the summer. And part plan B, it all going perfectly. Hopefully I will get my doctorate by the end of the year. That would be the ideal. And I've just confirmed with the the publisher of my first two books, Amberley, the third book that I've promised them. So I'll be starting on that. I'll be putting the thesis in the post and I'll be starting on my new new book for Amberley. And that's still on a Tudor theme? It is, yes. Yeah. I probably won't share it just at the moment, no. but once I kind of get pen to paper and I can share what's going on. Oh, wonderful. Well, your books are absolutely wonderful. So I'm sure this one will be just as fabulous. And that is exciting about your PhD. I wish you all the very best with getting <laughs> that into the mail and ticked off the list. That's yeah. incredible. I have one more question for you. I can't let you go without asking oh, yes. you for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. This isn't a fabulous Tudor resource at the moment, but if I could just mention my own website, melitathomas.com, where I have uh, information about events, because I will be speaking about a thousand Tudor people at very like the Harvington History Festival and various other events. So if you go to melitathomas.com, you'll find events. A useful Tudor resource. I mentioned it earlier, and even with its limitations, it's still very good and it is publicly available. The History of Parliament Online. Now, the History of Parliament was God knows how many tomes of Victorian study about every member of parliament there's ever been and they are slowly putting it online and it is so useful for knowing what offices people held or men obviously uh, who they were married to who their sons and fathers were who their brothers were because you quite often see MPs as families often information about their wills and who their legatees were so really really useful database about men of parliamentary rank which is gentry generally couldn't do without the history of parliament online yes i agree i have gone to that website many times and (laughs) utilized it so absolutely agree well thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to talk tutors with us thank you 
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Thank you.